So good evening. Um, it is a great uh, privilege uh, for me and also for uh, Dr. Ephthemios Stavropoulos that we uh, are chairing this uh, session with the invited lecture by Professor Thomas Derner. Uh, professor Thomas Derner uh, works at the, is a professor in, at the, of rheumatology at Charité University in Berlin and a group leader at the German Research Center. He has a long track record uh, in lupus and other autoimmune uh, diseases with uh, his work uh, focusing uh, particularly on, in, on the regulation of B cells in lupus. Uh, but he is also involved in um, <clears throat> several uh, therapeutic trials with uh, novel uh, agents in lupus and other diseases. Um, he has served as a member of uh, editorial boards uh, of leading journals in rheumatology and he has uh, chaired the scientific committee and other committees of uh, the EULAR. And uh, without any other delay, I invite him to present uh, us with his lecture on uh, biologic therapy for SLE and novel therapeutic targets. This is a state-of-the-art uh, lecture, so we will take uh, no uh, questions uh, at the end. Um, dear okay. George uh, and dear colleagues, it's a great pleasure uh, and uh, that I can take part in your uh, in your uh, uh, session here and uh, I take it as a great honor and please take all my apologies. Apparently my calendar mixed up time zones. Uh, I would uh, like to focus on new aspects, uh, in particular uh, biological therapy and uh, some new intracellular targets in lupus. Uh, and uh, we all know, and I followed the prior talk, and this is really very interesting. I, I think what, what's our ultimate goal is that when we follow the type 1 interferon signature, in which is characteristic of lupus, together with the plasma cell signature, that we better want to control the disease activity of our patients. And I think the promise is, and you have seen these nice slides already, or the, the insight, based on belimumab, that we are apparently able to reduce damage in our patients that improves the function, reduces the disability, and what we really hope, very similar as we what have seen with other in other diseases and therapeutics, that we can change the outcome of our patients, reduce the known premature death, uh, which is substantial, as we all know, in systemic lupus. Uh, coming back to how we understand lupus, uh, although we face apparently a very large heterogeneity uh, and how the influence of certain en environmental factors sub then lead by the activation of the immune system to inflammation and subsequent organ damage, how we think what is happening is up an activation of innate immunity, in particular dendritic cells uh, and the production of, production of cytokines. Most of the genetic factors are also here in somehow uh, reddish or orange. Uh, we have a substantial problem in waste management in lupus with increased defects of apoptosis, enhanced netosis, leading to the formation of immune complexes with RNP autoantigens, uh, subsequently enhancing T cell, B cell activation. And last but not least, what we all know, and I, I, it, it's quite intriguing, the induction of autoantibodies. And we, we use uh, some of the autoantibodies as a very important signature of the disease. If all of them are really key drivers of the immunopathogenesis, that's quite not clear, but I think it's quite clear that anti-DNA antibody is very characteristic and uh, presumably really the drivers uh, are involved in driving lupus nephritis at least and CNS lupus. And if we be believe in this, I think, and the, the most important precondition, and I think when we talk so much about innate immune activation, we need to bear in mind an important precondition and very characteristic of lupus is MHC class 2, in particular DR15, DR3. And I think this is the bridge how the immune activation comes from innate immunity into adaptive immunity. And I think just focusing on innate immune responses and or only adaptive immune responses really neglects this important bridge in, in the immunopathogenesis. So, uh, 
if we talk uh, some uh, how we face changes and want to undergo paradigm changes in lupus, we need to take into consideration that this is a very heterogeneous, maybe the most heterogeneous disease in rheumatology. It comes with a substantial risk risk of damage accrual and premature death. We see disturbances of innate and adaptive immunity. And the key challenges is how we can or should improve therapeutic responses that at the same time we are aiming for the reduction or minim minimization of the daily glucocorticoid usage. And based on the heterogeneity with a globally active activated immune system, I think coming with, from, with the lessons from lupus nephritis, I think it's also time to consider multi-target therapy, MTT concepts, or alternatively, and I think in particular looking for low dose IL-2, I don't have time today to go into this, uh, but maybe improving immunoregulation, something what we might also learn from uh, cancer therapy, immune cancer therapy, might also come with the promise of improving the outcome of our patients, not only controlling disease activity, but also improving the uh, outcome of our patients. Let's go now into some uh, new, newer insights. Uh, and uh, we know not, uh, it's not new hydroxychloroquine, but it's a very important uh, uh, also uh, asset in our therapeutic armamentarium. And if you might have seen uh, for RA, uh, compared to the venous thromboembolic revenge, if patients with RA receiving hydroxychloroquine, they have about, about two, two-fold lower risk of VTEs compared to patients with RA receiving methotrexate. But, but this is just a side note. I think it's still a very important uh, main factor in our therapeutic assets. But let's go a little bit into belimumab. You have already seen this. If I would have known this, I would have spared these two slides. Uh, the main point for belimumab is we have identified responder profiles. We have, let's say, also stratified the patients according to their clinical and other characteristics. But very, what is very remarkable, in addition to bliss ln now, the successful belimumab in lupus nephritis studies, there are four different trials that have subsequently arrived at the, or achieved the primary endpoint, the SRI4, using belimumab. And what I found really intriguing, this is data from uh, Murray Jurovic from Toronto, that belimumab over time, what you can see here in this curve, and this is a kind of survival curve of damage accrual under belimumab, in addition to standard of care compared to standard of care alone. This is a propensity matched analysis of the Toronto cohort. And I think what you can see over the years, in particular then beyond five years, six, seven, eight, there is a substantial reduction of damage accrual under standard of care uh, plus belimumab. Uh, this is also confirmed by Italian studies and long-term ex uh, extension studies. And I think, I think this finding is very robust. And I found this very intriguing because I would have not expected this years ago from Belimoma. So what are new treatment concepts? I already talked with you or touched a little bit on multi-targeting therapy, MTT. This can either be achieved by sequential combinations, simultaneous combinations, or using pleiotropic drugs. And one of the very uh, important pleiotropic drugs in, in lupus is still glucocorticoids. They do a lot of control of disease activity, but I, I, we are all aware that they, this comes with a substantial expense uh, to the substantial expense of side effects. And on the other hand, uh, I touched already on this is the introduction of immunomodulatory concepts. Uh, examples for sequential targeting, uh, in particular using rituximab as B cell depleting agent and followed by bliss inhibition. Early studies from uh, Leiden by Ono Tank, they found. Uh, if they use this in combination with an initial rituximab regimen followed by belimumab, they found really a substantial reduction of proteinuria, uh, and they expanded this. This is open lady uh, label, uh, then to altogether 14 patients found in a substantial uh, number of patients, in particular with lupus nephritis, 10 out 11 a, a complete response, four with complete response, the remaining six with partial response, and they found the reduction of this leader from 18 to two, 
uh, everything is uh, open. They are continuing this in a kind of uh, randomized controlled uh, fashion. The a randomized controlled study calibrated from the US using a different, some kind of different approach because they included also together with rituximab cyclophosphamide, this study in terms of renal response at one year or 48 weeks did not show any difference. Uh, and, and this was uh, quite remarkable. I, I'm not sure whether the addition of cyclophosphamide made such of a difference or whether, uh, uh, but we will see how the randomized trial by honor tang will uh, uh, end at the end. Other possibilities to, to some kind, at least partially use a kind of multi-target therapeutic approach is using, in addition to, uh, to different approaches to block the type one interferons. And we have seen data from cephalimumab, rontalizumab, who did not, uh, which did not achieve the primary endpoint. And the subsequent strategy was blocking the type 1 interferon or interferon alpha receptor, IFNA, by a monoclonal antibody, anifrolumab. Other strategies are also listed here. I will briefly touch on uh, BIB 059 at the end of my talk. So anifrolumab, very successful in a phase two trial comparing two different dosages over one year, 300 milligram and 1000 milligram uh, compared to placebo, uh, about 300 patients. Uh, the the, uh, the uh, half year data, as you can see here, in particular in the interferon high population, not so remarkable in the interferon low population, uh, showed a uh, uh, difference or a remarkable difference, almost more than 50%. And this even further enhanced uh, at the end of the, uh, of the study towards the primary endpoint or one year endpoint. Uh, in this study, uh, a number of uh, higher rates of herpes zoster, as one would expect if we block type 1 interferons as a very important antiviral factor, uh, were noted as, uh, as a really important finding that the, the, the therapeutic principle is apparently effective. So let's go now, and, and you have all heard this, and I briefly only have uh, one slide on that. Uh, anifrolumab in phase three. There was the TULIP1 and TULIP2 data, uh, and initially uh, it, it was powered uh, for SRI4, but they changed not for TULIP1, but for TULIP2, then the primary endpoint. Here you can see for TULIP1, published in Lancet Rheumatology last year, uh, no differentiation between the selected 300 milligram dose, which was superior or the best one in the phase two compared to placebo arm. No other doses uh, was carried forward. And the BICLA response was somehow different at the end of this study, but uh, it was very closely and at, at most time points, the confidence intervals were overlapping. The other study, one uh, copy paste the same strategy, but they recruited in different parts of the world. They achieved a very good separation of the uh, 300 milligram compared to placebo dose here for the BICLA, but also the SRI4 was in, in this case for uh, TULIP2 significant difference. So that with, with this uh, positive phase two data, one positive phase three data trial and one negative trial, uh, there is apparently now uh, some undertaking uh, to get approval for this therapy. At the end, the difference even here in TULIP2 between the active and the placebo group is about 12% in a range what we also see uh, or have seen for bilimumab. Whether this affects the same population or is effective in the same population or not, we do not know. What has not at least convincingly confirmed for me is that there is a separation, a better response in the interferon high versus interferon low uh, lupus population. This is quite remark remarkable. And this, as far as I have understood the data, applies for both studies. So this has not been replicated from the phase two. So another possibility to target uh, type one interferons is to target PDCs. PDCs have a unique let's say, expression of a molecule BDCA, which is a lectin on their surface. Uh, and usually, uh, if BDCA is ligated, this leads to a PDC uh, depletion. 
But an antibody, which is not a depleting antibody, anti-BDCA, uh, it's a monoclonal antibody from Biogen, by BIB-059. In the remainder of my talk, I will simply call it O59, is able to inhibit PDC activation via several mechanisms, at least, at least two different mechanisms. One is F uh, FC receptor independent. It simply inhib inhibits the production of cytokines and chemokines. And the other one is FC dependent. It leads to the CD32AA FC gamma receptor 2A down modulation and is able to block PDC activation via the immune complexes, which is considered a very important driver of autoimmune antibody complexes driving overactivation of PDCs. Very nice studies uh, carried out by and published by Lars Rundblom in Uppsala and, and this group. So at the, at the end, it's, it is expected to substantially down red, uh, reduce all the key cytokines and chemokines. A phase one study has been uh, shown um, uh, promising results in lupus, but also very interesting results in cutaneous lupus, where PDCs are also apparently drivers of the immunopathogenesis. This is again highlighted the mechanism of this antibody here, which is uh, FC dependent and FC independent, at least uh, not depletes, but substantially inhibits the activation or the, the, the active activation status of uh, plasma cytodendritic cells. So a uh, first study, and I found this very intriguing, and you may forgive me I, that I only share the slide here with you. It published a few days ago uh, and uh, reported by Richard Fury uh, at, the EULA, uh, at the ACR convergence at the beginning of November. Very intriguing, uh, 46 patients under placebo were, were compared to 450 milligram of O59, 56 here, and to see as a readout, the arthritis here, the total active joint count, that is tender and swollen joint, a good separation over 24 weeks, and very interesting rapid onset of action within the first eight weeks. You see already that the confidence intervals uh, go apart. If they looked for the SRI4, so taking a more global look on, on the patients, uh, you see also here an early separation uh, then becoming significant from week, week 16 on. And here you it's almost a 50% increase compared to placebo in the patients who have received the antibody. Uh, very interesting development. The only concern not demonstrated or confirmed here. There were no really substantial, in particular, viral infections, but the observation was only 24 weeks. And uh, I think it's very important to go further with that, but have a very close look on the potential of, of, uh, of the in enhancement of viral, in particular, herpes zoster reactivation, which is very important uh, also under PDC control. So let's go and uh, take some aspects on Bruton's tyrosine kinase inhibitors. We know uh, that this is an antibody, uh, th that this is a strategy that has already approval in patients with CLL. It is so almost, let's say, substituting in particular certain antibodies right, like uh, rituximab, the anti CD20 antibodies, because of the uh, Bruton's tyrosine kinase inhibitors like ibrutinib and acalabrutinib are so strong. And coming from our learnings in, uh, in, in, in lupus, where we use a lot of rituximab, there is a hope that the blockade of BTK, which is not uh, act, uh, very important in B cells, but also in myeloid cells, basophils, but also partly expressed in thrombocytes, that there should be uh, some if, uh, therapeutic value in that. And if you compare Avoprotinib, ebrutinib in the dendrogram here of their specificity, specificity, they have a lot of additional off-target effects. This is not true for one of the first uh, BTK inhibitor data have been published in lupus last year, also in RA, a very and highly selective Bruton's tyrosine kinase inhibitor, phenobrutinib. That's the development of Genentech and Roche, GDC of 8834. Uh, uh, almost each large pharmaceutical company has uh, a BTK inhibitor uh, in autoimmunity. Some of them are also in development of lupus and RA. 
uh, including the Kruvashitinib uh, by BMS. Uh, the first study published last year compared fenibrutinib, uh, the BTK inhibitor I was just mentioning in a low and high dose and compared to placebo over 48 weeks. And the first author, David Eisenberg, this was a quite standard uh, general lupus population and uh, quite remarkable and breathtaking for the community. No separation between placebo and either dose. No therapeutic value for fenibrutinib at each dose compared to placebo. If you take the SRI4 or the SRI4 with oral corticosteroid tapering uh, into account. So it could have been this molecule or uh, the last ACR, uh, it, an additional uh, BTK, uh, BTK inhibitor, evobrutinib, with a very good, uh, even a New England Journal of pa uh, England paper uh, with efficacy in relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis was studied in lupus. And you could almost the same curve, two different dosages and placebo, uh, three different dosages, you may, uh, please excuse me, three different dosages and placebo, uh, but very similar. You see the curves uh, as we have seen in fenibrutinib, no differentiation between placebo and both dosages. Uh, uh, thanks God, there is no uh, apparent uh, safety concern. Uh, there was no observation of any bleeding or infectious complication, but the conclusions of this uh, abstract was very interesting at, at the end. Uh, these results combined with the negative results of the fenibrutinib SLE study suggest that BTK inhibitors is not a BTK inhibition is not an effective therapeutic intervention for patients with lupus. Okay, possibly at least uh, I think it applies to fenibrutinib and evobrutinib, uh, but it might be possibly correct because if we look into our data, we published this uh, last year there is enhanced phosphotyrosine phosphatase activity in lupus B cells. We call this a kind of post-activation status of these B cells in autoimmunity and what they have in common, common and in particular what you see here in, in, in B cells from lupus patients. This is a substantially enhanced intracellular phosphatase activity, which is basically overactivated in this status. And when this is active already, by the disease or naturally comes with the disease. Uh, what can you ach achieve if you block a kinase like BTK, uh, if you have already an enhanced phosphatase activity in place because every phosphorylation of BTK will be immediately in those patients dephosphorylated because of this intracellular preconditioning. And I think uh, th therefore it makes sense uh, that all the, the, these clinical study data are plausible uh, because this has also been reported for T cells, CD4 and CD8 T cells, uh, that they have a different status in post activation. Let's go in the last uh, few minutes into aspects of uh, blocking uh, JAK STAT pathway in lupus. Uh, and I think this is one of the possibilities if you take into account that belimumab is uh, blocking one cytokine. B lymphocyte, B lymphocyte stimulator, which belongs to the TNF family. Uh, but a possibility with the JAK inhibitors in different fashions, but there we have a simultaneous possibility to block uh, at the same time uh, very important key cytokines considered in the pathogenesis of lupus, like type 1, type 2 interferons, IL-6, 12, 23, 21, uh, and maybe this is an opportunity to block all the, of them with one orally available molecule. And at the same time, maybe it's a good thing that we leave apart all the other cytokines that can still be, uh, can serve immune protection and other homeostatic uh, conditions. So uh, if uh, one bears in mind, uh, not all of the cytokines are using the jak uh, pathways, but we have a different encoding of different cytokines and altogether 57 different cytokines and chemokines are using the jak uh, pathways. And how we design them in terms of their preferred specificity, JAK1, JAK2, JAK3 or JAK2, 
we can also inhibit uh, more or less selectively one or the other cytokine all the time to the expense that we might have some off-target effects in other, let's say, very important homeostatic mechanisms like myelopoiesis, for example, uh, producing thrombocytes, uh, lymphocytes, and neutrophils, for example. If we look, at, does it, so the question is, does it make sense to go with the jack stat uh, inhibition or in particular JAK inhibition in lupus? Quite well. I think there are data from Serbia, uh, from uh, Poveshek. Uh, they looked into CD4 T cells. They found that those are really substantially enhancing the stat uh, uh, transcription, not essentially the phosphorylation. The phosphorylation is not so much different, but the transcription of that one correlated with this disease activity captured by SLIDA in, in those patients. Some of them are adolescent lupus patients. We did similar things in adults suffering from lupus. We found the same in lupus, not again on for phosphorylated stud, but mainly for the transcriptional highly activated stud one as shown here. And again, it, it correlated with the disease activity the enhanced uh, expression of STAT1, not the phosphorylated STAT1. A number of uh, JAK inhibitors are uh, in development for lupus. None of them have been uh, uh, approved. Uh, the most advanced development is for paracetinib. As we all know, it's approved for RA uh, by the EMA and the two milligram by the, by the FDA. Uh, but others are also uh, following this pathway. The first one that has been studied was a selective JAK1 inhibitor by JSK. Uh, th this trial was uh, halfway uh, discontinued uh, after 50 patients. There was no significant change of the interferon transcriptional expression, what would have been expected based on therapeutic efficacy considerations. Few, uh, uh, two uh, patients uh, had uh, a drug reaction of eosinophilia and systemic symptoms, and a substantial number also developed liver function abnormalities. Tofacitinib, a first trial, more or less powered for, uh, or not powered, uh, designed for safety considerations, has, uh, has been reported last year. No, so that most of the, the, the patients were not uh, active enough, uh, but at least it was safe enough and no herpes zoster reactivation was seen. The first uh, study, phase two, uh, was published uh, two years ago uh, for paracetinib. 300 patients randomized into placebo, paracetinib 2 milligram and 4 milligram have been studied over half a year, so only 24 weeks. And the primary endpoint was the, was the resolution of the arthritis and rush uh, based on the SLIDA 2K assessment. The 4 milligram at half year was significantly better than placebo. In between was the two milligram, but the two milligram was not significantly different. Uh, if you look for the SRI4, which was not the primary endpoint, 64 at half year achieved SRI4 compared to 48% in the placebo group. Uh, so there was the, the, the not impressive the two milligram. We, we can, I'm happy to discuss this with you anyhow. Uh, but what has been observed, uh, and this is shown here, uh, on, on the gene expression level, uh, there was enhanced, in particular as expected, type 1 interferon uh, molecules or transcripts expressed in between also among the 50 highest expressed transcription, STAT1 and STAT2. And there was a substantial co-expression of STAT1 and, and STAT2 in about two-thirds of the patients. Uh, under ther therapy in all patients and the patients with interferon high, there was shown here with the, with the uh, red curve, a reduction of the type one interferon gene signature. Not so impressive, I have to say, for the, for the selective patients and in between, again, the two milligram uh, patients. Uh, this was not correlated with the improvement of clinical activity. There was no influence by corticosteroids and we did a number uh, or a lot of additional studies, but uh, we could not really here in this analysis find a correlate of uh, with the disease activity improvement. The only thing, and this is also published here, that is open access, downstream of STAT1, STAT2, and STAT4, there are molecules that correlated with improvements of the disease activity, 
uh, but those molecules are still under further validation and investigation. Uh, we rather want to make sure before we publish this, but there are a number of candidates. Uh, we also this year at the EULA and ACR uh, uh, reported data from uh, on, on the expression level of on the protein expression level that in particular uh, the uh, there was a reduction of the P40 chain of IL-1223 correlating with improvements of the disease activity as well as with IL-6, especially or uniquely with the four milligram dose, not for the two milligram dose compared to placebo. And the re remarkable finding was there was no relation, anyhow, no substantial reduction of type 1 and type 2 interferons here measured on the protein level. Um, I don't have a kind of conclusion slide, but I, what I wanted to highlight to you is, and I think we have learned a lot now with the substantial developments and breathtaking uh, improvements in lupus nephritis, we have multiple phases and heterogeneity of lupus. We have also new EULA SER classifications and proposals how we capture best low disease activity and remission based also or simultaneously with the, with the reduction uh, of the daily glucocorticoid usage. And uh, using only uh, either when can, one can use an one or oligo target approach if one focuses on one or the other disease manifestation only, but it's better maybe to use a kind of multi-target therapy uh, approach in order to have coverage for all of the heterogeneous manifestations Examples are the sequences of rituximab and belimumab. I tried to highlight you, in addition to glucocorticoids, the value of paracetinib, anifolumab, and then as another example, the anti pdca uh, therapeutic approach or the monoclonal. And this jury is still out whether immune modulation, as an example with low-dose IL-2, has similar value, so just working on the other angle of immune activation before we might be able, and I think George is one of the pioneers in that, that we are using then a very combined genome epigenetic transcriptome approach, defining the patients in addition to their clinical picture that, that we can pre-select the most promising therapeutic uh, uh, at the beginning with the diagnosis, hopefully. But that is something we still have a lot to do uh, in, in, the, uh, in the next years. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. I have to thank a lot of my co-workers and colleagues over the years. And thank you again for the invitation and uh, uh, all my best uh, greetings to Greece. Thank you very much, Professor Dorre, for your excellent lecture. Uh, very elucidating. Thank you very much. You're more than welcome. Thomas, thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Dimitrios, nice to hear you. Good night. Thank Good night. you. Good night. Good night.